Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, an extremely fascinating woman. Her name, Yusai Khan. And Yusai Khan is a TV host, TV producer, philanthropist, businesswoman, and considered by People Magazine the most famous woman in China. Let's all welcome Yusai Khan. And Yusai, it is a great honor and privilege to have you on my show. I consider you a wonderful friend and really a great role model. And I want to start with the titles that People Magazine and Time Magazine gave you. How do you feel about those? And how do you live up to being the queen of the Middle Kingdom? I don't have to live up to it, Jeannie. I, because <laughs> you know why? Because I didn't give myself that title. They gave it to me. Uh, if, I feel very flattered because if uh, they call me that, it's probably, they feel that, that I deserve it, right? Maybe, maybe. But it's, uh, it's flattering, of course. Uh, this is, these are not normal titles. Um, so uh, hopefully what we have done have made some, made some uh, changes in the society we live in, you know? Yes, and I don't think Time Magazine or People Magazine give away titles lightly. And so it's a great tribute to you. Now, you were born in China and then you were raised in Hong Kong and later came to New York City. Why did you come to New York? Well, actually, this is how it started. I, I was born in China, I was raised in Hong Kong, and at 16, I went to Hawaii. And that's where I went to Brigham Young University to school. And after my college years, I came to New York and I never really, I never really left New York. And, and that's where we, that's where we meet each other. And then that's how we meet, especially we meet each other amongst, uh, in these beautiful charity events that we go to, right? And you, you always have been very successful, very, very, uh, very charitable to the, the events that I hosted. So I'm always very grateful to, to you, Jean. Well, thank you because you do great work, Yusai. Now, Yusai, let's talk a little bit about your TV career. In the 70s and early 80s, in those years, doing a show about Asia, well, the most important thing is that uh, you are very worried that nobody was watching it, right? I mean, because in those days, who, who was interested in Asia? It's different today. You're, you're talking about different world. And in those days, I remember Mike Wallace once said to me, he said, oh, you're doing a show on Asia, looking east about Asia. I, I, you know, that's not such a good idea because nobody cared about Asia. But of course, he was absolutely wrong. Uh, and today, everybody talks about Asia, focusing in Asia, and, and that is the fastest growing area in the world is Asia. So the show Looking East was really way about, uh, way before its time. Nobody was thinking about it, but that's when you really should be doing it, right? So from oh, there, uh, yeah, from there, uh, I, was, I was asked by China Central Television, which is the state-owned television station, to ask me to, um, to ask me to do a series called One World. Now that was also very historic because it's the first time they asked an American passport holder actually to do a TV show for China and they were very smart. In that time, 1984, five, six, seven, those are the days, years when China just began to open. Before that, China was totally closed up, really closed up. And um, they, they, they decided to open themselves. And they said to themselves, well, what is the best way to open ourselves? They decided that television would be the way to go. So they, they that is a long story, but they found me. They, they did, because of Looking East, they, they, they knew about me. And they asked me to do a series of a uh, show called One World, which was meant to, to, to introduce them 
to the outside world, outside of China. Now that is really historic because they had never seen anything about the world outside of China at that time. And they say to themselves, now how are we gonna open China up unless outside people know about us and we know about outside people. So the series was meant to um, teach them about the outside world. So I really took it very seriously because I was very worried that at any time this uh, opportunity might be closed up, you know, this window might be closed up. So the, the story of my doing the TV series for China, that made me the most famous woman in China. And that was the reason, you know, look at, in those days, Chinese television had only six hours of TV and the television host was never like you and me, you know, we were in color and jewelry and makeup. And, 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 then, and then they encouraged me to do it exactly the same way I do in America, my, my show. So I wore jewelry, I wore makeup, I wore colorful clothes. Don't forget China was dark in those days, you know, I mean, gray, everything was gray. Color just did not ex exist. And so it was a very a special kind of time. And it was a very special series that I did. And that, that made me a, 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 a household name in China because Which I was on, on only, only network in China, right? I'm and, a, I was only, only. and this is absolutely fascinating. And so you, you not only brought something uh, to the people of the United States by giving them a view of Asian life, you did the same in China with the Chinese Asian people, showing them the Western world. And then I understand you started a makeup line, which is the largest makeup line in China. And I think you did that in 1992. Again, another genius move. And what, what exactly prompted you to start that makeup line? It's, it's a very interesting time. Uh, after June 4th, which is the Tiananmen incident, I got married and I went to China. The vice premier, Tian Yun at that time, invited me and my then husband for dinner. And he said, you know, China is going through a very difficult time. This time is uh, uh, difficult because all after June 4th, after Tiananmen incident, all the foreign companies left China because they were scared. And, and he said that, you know, if you come in at this time and start a business, it would be wonderful. It will look very good and it will also help to boost the, 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 the confidence of the Chinese people. So I remember that night, um, I, I thought it was such a bizarre idea. I mean, I always done television and all that. And, and uh, my then husband asked me what I would like to do. I said, cosmetics. I said, <laughs> cosmetics, because when you do television, as you know, you, you really need to know how to use cosmetics. And when I'm doing, when I was doing all this on location shoot, if I didn't know how to put my makeup on, I, oh, first of all, I had no money to bring a makeup artist or stylist or anything. I had to prepare everything myself, doing so much on location work. So I knew how, uh, how to use cosmetics by myself. And I knew how difficult it was to buy cosmetics for, 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 for my needs. I mean, I have black hair, black eyes, you know, and flat face, flat face, small eyes, right? And, and flat nose. And my, my, my making up, the, my techniques of making up probably are totally different from yours. But your colorings are different, even though you have dark eyes. But, but the, basically our, the feature, the feature, if you really know makeup, you know that you don't need to emphasize your nose, but I do. I need to, I need to learn how to make my nose a bit more um, uh, with a little bit of height. <laughs> so, so the face doesn't look like a mooncake, you know? So oh, you look beautiful. I think you <laughs> are absolutely beautiful. And I think most people think that Yusai Khan is an exquisitely beautiful woman. I understand you even won a beauty contest many years ago, correct? Yeah, it was in a Hawaii. Very, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's when I was 19 years old, you know. She, when you were 19 years old and this school came to you and said, oh, well, we would like you to represent us to run this uh, beauty pageant. Of course, I, I went to beauty pageant. Now, come to think of it, it, that really was a mind boggling experience because I never used cosmetics before. I learned to use cosmetics for the first time. And can you imagine this experience really led to my experience in opening a cosmetic company, am I right? And then when I was doing the, 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 uh, the training for the beauty pageant, they also trained me how to answer questions and how to look at the light and how to, how to look at the camera and how to, how, to, how to project myself. So that was amazing because th that experience really led very much directly into my future businesses, which is television and cosmetics. And anyway, the reason why I thought of cosmetics, it was a very simple one because just nobody in China was using cosmetics. And I said, I, China is for sure opening. And if they don't use cosmetics uh, now, doesn't mean that they don't use cosmetics now and uh, later on. So if somebody has to introduce it to them. So I said, I know their needs. I know exactly what I, nobody told me and I had to learn it by myself. So I, call, I started a cosmetic company in China. I also heard that you had a home line of products. In, in those days, China was really an undeveloped country. It was terrible, it was really terrible uh, infrastructure. You don't ship things, you can't ship things around. And, and the whole populace, population really didn't even think of using cosmetics. They didn't, some people were, dead against using it. And certainly they did not um, many, it was, um, it was literally, I was opening this, this market that never happened before. So I had to overcome all of these, I had to, all these obstacles that I had to really uh, educate the entire population to how to use makeup, for example, and instead of getting nervous about it or, or, or uh, against it. So, so I, I, we opened that business. Um, so what were you asking me about, about the home line? The, the home, home line, yes. Another interesting idea. Because China in those days, just beginning, Chinese people were beginning to buy houses, so buy homes, right? And they, they always thought that, well, now that I have a new home, I'm going to buy a TV, and I'm going to buy two couches, and that is interior designing. As a matter of fact, interior design itself as a course to teach in universities did not exist until much, 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 much later. So this is the reason why I even did a book called, um, I, I featured 25 of the top interior designers in the world, and that, that would teach them how to actually um, decorate their homes. And so I, I um, so those are the things that I did because I saw that there was a need for it. And I needed to, I needed them to understand it better. So because of my television show, they really trusted me a great deal. So uh, launching my cosmetics and all the others are really were very, uh, were much easier for me than for most people, but they already knew my name, you know, the name, I used the name of my name to, to do my, my, my products. And I would love to hear about your a charity, and I know you do a lot. I know you're very involved with the China Institute here in the United States. And then you've actually built schools and you've built um, all sorts of places in China to help the people. Before we talk about that though, I wanna talk about one other thing and that is um, your involvement as chairman of the Miss China Universe contest. I think it's fascinating how you do everything and I love that you are able to do everything and and do it well talk about that pageant and how important it is in China I uh I, I don't know how important it is really for China but the idea is that when a girl is beautiful is born beautiful I told those girls who are, who are beautiful who wanted to become uh, uh mid China I told them I said you know, when you, when you are born beautiful, you did not earn it. You didn't do a thing. God gave it to you. So it's your job to do something with that beauty. 
and do something good for the society with that beauty. So with that idea, I really try to train them. We have regionals around the country. And then the final is, uh, was always in Shanghai. And, uh, and, and then every year, the final competition in which we select a girl to run for the international competition, we also use it as an opportunity to do charity. And, uh, and I tell you, it, like we sold out all the seats, you know, in, in two weeks because it was such a wonderful, uh, it was fun for people to go and people always love going to see who's going to be the next Miss China. And we, we make about, in China, we make about $1.5 million every single year for that, with that charity. And then we, we donated to people, the kids who have cleft palate problems. And so you can imagine how much we can do with, with that. And, and it was a good example for young people so that they know that they have to give something back to the society. I think uh, philanthropy is very important, not only in the United States, but it's uh, important worldwide. And uh, you saw, I think I told her the story of on one of my two trips to China, this was the second one back in 2013, I received a call from my husband who asked me to meet with the Shanghai Charitable Foundation. And my husband has a different friends that uh, through business who um, at that time were working in China and pretty much all around the world. And so I was very excited about meeting this Chinese charity group. And I met with them in their corporate offices and um, they had said that they had raised something like $2 billion since the beginning of the 90s uh, to help with some of the problems confronting the people in and around Shanghai. And they mentioned that the charities were part of the government. And I'm wondering, is that still the case today? Are the charities still part of the Chinese government or are they separated the way uh, they are separated here in the US? Uh, they, they, everything in China is Chinese government now. So let's just put it the right way. Uh, but what they're telling you was really not true. Uh, in a sense, not true. Because uh, when I first started doing, uh, doing, uh, doing charity in China, it was, uh, it, they, were, they thought we were joking. It was a Dao Xiao, you know, it was, you were joking. You mean you give away money to people? Because it, it's, not a Chinese, it's not a Chinese culture. It's not a Chinese uh, culture to give away money like that. You know, that, the charity that we know of, it's not the same as uh, it's in China. So uh, if you think about uh, communism, communism is a very special kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, structure for the, for, for. Ch communism wanted to originally, ch communism wanted to give you, uh, to take care of your citizens from cradle to grave. That's really what it's supposed to be. It, that this is the reason why they will have give you tickets for meals and tickets for meat and oil and all of this. And they plan everything. It's a totally planned economy. So charity, at the very, very beginning, people were trying to give money to the Chinese and they were embarrassed actually. So it was, so even in the eighties when I started, people thought it was a joke. So and then it, it started changing, changing um, more and more. Um, by the time I was really involved, it, but for example, before they didn't even have um, tax deductions. So at first it was 2% and then 10% and 12% that you could deduct, but it's not, the deduction meaning is different meaning than here. Deduction in China really means that you have to make that profit and deduct from that profit. So in, in America, we, we, we can deduct, right? I mean, very, very, very easily. So, so it's charity, charity was so new at the beginning and today uh, is a, it's, it's totally amazing, totally amazing. T today, uh, like everything in China, you know, grows really fast and move really, really fast. We were, um, um, you know, at, at this moment, it, it, the whole, you cannot even begin to think 
what is going to happen, what's happening in China. You would never have an idea what's happening in China at this moment. That the Chinese government had a um, had a a slogan called the share prosperity. What does share prosperity really mean? Share prosperity really means that you, if you have prosperity, you are asked to share with your fellow man. Okay, so let's just give you a little bit of idea what is uh, what is uh, happening. And so far, just this year alone, seven billionaires in China had donated six billion dollars to charity. And I want to talk about COVID in China. We are now in the fall of 2021. What is going on in China? Is is COVID pretty much over in China? And uh, is, are the people okay, or was there tremendous suffering as there was here in the United States and elsewhere in the world? Well, I don't really know the actual number of deaths. I can guarantee you, you guarantee you that they, we don't that China doesn't have seven hundred thousand people who died like you in the United States, and and the Chinese are very obedient, as you know. There's a centralized government. If they say wear a mask, you wear a mask in China. And, and, and they, they, are, they are draconian. But what is interesting right at this moment is that even though China has a policy of zero tolerance for, for, for COVID, so they, they take draconian measures. If they discover that there are 100 people in this province, that is uh, this town that is, that's, uh, has COVID, they lock the town out. They lock the town down completely. But the most interesting thing that's happening in China to that I find is fascinating is that they decided that COVID or a form of COVID, if it is not COVID, it is called Delta. If it is not called Delta, it could be Ebola. It could be anything, you know, they, they believe like George Bush and Bill Gates believe in their speeches that, that this kind of pandemic will happen over and over again in the world. So the Chinese have now a new policy of building quarantine centers. You know that you cannot go to China today because they will, if you go, if you, even if they give you a visa, you're gonna to have to go 14 days of quarantine, which is really not a fun thing to do, especially in the kind of places that they put you in, it's really disgusting. But if they have quarantine centers that they actually can build, they unify all the, the, the protocols for these quarantine centers in every city. Then in that case, it's much easier. I understand that some of them, they actually use robots to, to, to do Can you imagine your robot would deliver food to your room or the robot might one day clean your room in your room? I mean, some, today for two years, I mean, for two, for 14 days, they don't even clean your room. It's really pretty horrible. But if you have robots, you know, the robot come over to you and, 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 and test your, test your, your, your nose for your test. I mean, it's, that's a pretty extraordinary idea. So, um, so you're asking a very interesting question because that is the latest, this latest, um, latest, um, latest policy in terms of dealing with, with, um, with COVID. Essentially, China is basically closed. The border of China is closed because of border. Oh, you need to have very special permit to go, unless you are from Hong Kong or Taiwan. Those people can go with their passport to China. But even if then they would, they would want you to, to quarantine for 14 days, which is really not an easy thing to do. Imagine 14 oh. days. No, it's not. And someday in the future, I hope to go back to China because I had two wonderful trips. And I really enjoyed meeting the people who were just charming and lovely. And to see all the development in China was absolutely fascinating and brand new infrastructure in Shanghai. And, and, and then to experience the beautiful art and architecture and uh, the delicious cuisine. I had fantastic food while I was there. And it was an all round wonderful experience. Uh, you are one of the, you are a very rare person because if you read all those things about China today, it's nothing but negative things. But unless you have been to China, you really cannot think, cannot say anything about China if you have never been. 
because China is so different from what people, if you read only the Western medias here, you will, you will think that China is the most horrible place ever, right? I mean, that, 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 that the government is extremely, you know, mean or anything. No, I mean, I'm an American citizen, no? And I go there and I, even though, of course, I'm famous, <laughs> but still, uh, but still, I, I can feel, and I have a lot of friends in China, quite, quite obviously, life has certainly changed. People talk about freedom. I mean, without this COVID, uh, uh, the year before COVID, 120 million Chinese came out of China and 120 million Chinese went back to China. So it's a, it's a very, people keep saying it's not free. It's, I don't know what they are saying because it's so different from what I experienced and what you experienced. Yes, I had very positive experiences on my two trips to China and I found a Shanghai uh, to be a very welcoming. The people were very welcoming and the city was a very beautiful and glamorous place to visit. And of course, I also left Shanghai and went to other sections of China and I, find, I found them fascinating, again, with very kind and uh, sweet people. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left, Yusai. And what would you like to leave the audience with? China is a fascinating place. I would say that if you really have the opportunity, I say go visit it, because you will never know what you're looking at. They're, they're, they have gone through a human revolution in the last 40 years that will never be repeated again. Uh, they have taken a billion, 400 million people out of poverty. They are providing housing for all these people. They are providing them with education. They are providing them with medical. And then and now they are providing them with equalization, meaning that they're providing them with the opportunity to grow, to, to equalize. In, and in other words, instead of looking at people that are way, way so, so rich and way, way so poor, there's no such a thing anymore. So I think that unless we are going there for a little period of time, uh, a period of time just to learn about them. We have no right to talk about that. You know, so sometimes I find that what I understand is very different from what I read sometimes. And then and their policies, even though I may not agree with the policy or the way they handle the policy, sometimes I feel that they, they, they might have a point there. You know, uh, I, I need to be a little bit more patient or a little bit more... Um, humble in the way I judge, I judge the way they do things. I'm in the media business in China and I know that it's very tough to be in the media business in China because they really, you know, free speech is definitely not an area that China, you know, clearly is open to, you know, so they control every aspect of media. But, um, but in other areas, you know, pretty damn good what they have done, uh, what they have achieved. And I look forward to going back uh, to China one day. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Our guest today, Yusai Khan. People Magazine called her the most famous Chinese woman. Yusai Khan is a TV host, TV producer, an author, businesswoman, and philanthropist. I'm Jean Shafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.